Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Priscila Rodriguez Garcia, and I'm a PhD candidate in molecular genetics, and I'm also the president of the Ohio State SACNAS chapter. And on behalf of our chapter and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Ohio State, who is sponsoring this event, uh, we want to welcome you to the 2021 SACNAS OSU keynote event. So every year as part of the SACNAS OSU keynote event, we invite a scientist with a history and active role in promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM as our keynote speaker. And this year is no exception. So we would like to introduce uh, our 2021 keynote speaker, Dr. Ximena Sid. Ximena is a Chicana Yaki physicist. She is associate professor and chair of the physics department at California State University, Dominguez Hills. She is one of few Chicanas and one of the first, if not the first, indigenous person to chair a physics department in the country. Today, Jimena will share pieces of her lived experiences that have created the foundation for her current roles. She will discuss her research that explores who is, who is and who is not studied in physics, education, research, and how the data influences ideas of measures of success. Finally, she invites participants to contribute to the development of what our future science will look like. So with the title, The Lessons I've Learned, what does it mean to be a scientist? What does it mean to be successful? How long does it take to develop expert-like thinking? Who gets to decide? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shimena Sid. So I will now stop sharing and give the floor over to Dr. Sid. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for um, spending your time with me today. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very excited um, to share a little bit about my path um, and share a little bit about the work that I do um, and, and, and the lens in which we actually do uh, our science. Um, I do identify as Chicana and Yaqui. Um, and I sometimes say that I'm uh, one of the first, if not the first, uh, indigenous chair, um, but I say that with a grain of salt because um, indigenous identity is very complex and um, how people identify as indigenous um, is very personal and, and sometimes political. So <clears throat> um, I'm gonna share my screen um, so that we can begin. And I hope that, um, you know, I, I hope that I will be able to engage you along the way on a little bit about my journey. Um, so as mentioned, I'm associate professor and chair of the Department of Physics uh, at California State University, Dominguez Hills. We are located on the southwest side of Los Angeles, um, so near Compton. Um, and it's very interesting to be at my institution. Our institution was founded in a very social justice um, vein in the sense that our campus was originally designed to be located in a, a different location, very wealthy, affluent um, area of LA County. And then the Watts riots happened and our campus was moved to our current location, Compton. And so our campus is primarily black and brown uh, students. However, our faculty still um, do not match the demographics of our campus that we support. So that's something that we kind of, you know, we are introduced to when we are hired and when we work in our space that we do have this social justice, um, you know, focus. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I applied to our campus is because of the commitment that we have um, to supporting um, inclusion for everyone in our spaces. So that's a little bit where, where we're located. My campus is located on the traditional lands of the Tongva people. Um, and so I, I also wanna honor and give thanks for the continued protection that the Tongva people provide. I also want to acknowledge that we are part of the CSU system, California State University system, which is the largest institution, largest system of, of higher learning in the country. We have about 26 different campuses. Um, and, and California is a very interesting in the way that our education is built into the constitution of our state. So we have our, our two-year colleges, we have our CSU systems, which are primarily undergraduate and master's granting institutions, and then we have the UCs, 
which are the PhD granting institutions. And so our, our systems are structured in a very specific way. Um, and I never knew that because I'm from California, I'm from Northern California originally. And when I went to other states on my academic journey um, and looked at the different institutions and, and like the UT system, um, they were kind of a mix and I was really confused about what that meant. And so um, the more that I learned about our state history and the education, I kind of started to understand those differences. So the thank yous that I wanted to uh, start with, throw out, first of all, thank you, the Ohio State University, um, as well as the Sackness ch chapter for the invitation to spend some time with all of you uh, today. I also wanted to acknowledge um, my collaborators who over the past few years have um, really kind of supported the ideas that I've always known about um, inequities in higher ed, um, but they really uh, created a space where we could actually talk um, from a scientific perspective that we could actually present data to show what these inequities are. Um, two of which are in the audience, um, and I'm so happy that they were able to join us. Um, Jennifer Blue, Adrian Trexel, both faculty at neighboring Ohio uh, universities, so welcome to them as well and the spaces that they um, are a part of. But also I, I wanted to acknowledge Steve Canham, Emeritus faculty from New Mexico State University and Ramon Bartholomew from University of Utah. Um, and I, I'm very appreciative that my field is starting to, um, you know, look at uh, Jedi work, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, um, with a very focused intent on, on making things better. Um, we are in a field that is often the least diverse um, and, and has this traditional way of processing um, that we are fact-based, right? And everything is just about facts and there's no social aspect, but we are still humans who are doing this work and our own um, lens that we use influences the way that we view our, our science. So I'm very grateful that some of them are able to, to join. It's been so long since I've seen some of my colleagues. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy that they're here as well. So I'm gonna start today um, with the questions that I have in the title. And um, I'm hoping that we can use the chat function just for about five minutes or so. Um, at least I'll pay attention to that. Um, and then we'll get to the questions at the end as well. If I see questions that come in the chat while I'm going, I'll try and stop and answer them. It's easier for me to address what's happening in the moment than, it, than to kind of wait till the end. But I wanted to um, you know, reintroduce these questions and what is it that we who are all in the audience how do we process them? So what does it mean to be a scientist? What does it mean to be successful? How long does it take to develop expert-like thinking? And another way I can say that is, how long did it take for you to acknowledge that you are a scientist? Did that happen at the undergrad level? Did it happen when you first got into research? Did it happen um, at a different stage? I'm curious to know that. Um, and then who gets to decide? So I'm gonna spend about five minutes, I hope, where I can engage with all of you. And maybe we can um, answer questions by putting like say one colon, two colon, three colon, four colon, um, and then some of your ideas about each of these questions. You're free to answer all four of them. You're free to answer just one, but I do kind of want to get a sense of where we're coming from um, as an audience. So if we can start to type in what our thoughts are on what does it mean to be a scientist? What does it mean to be successful? Um, so I, I see some folks already starting to type in, um, please jump in um, so that I can kind of get an idea because this also, also helped me shape how I wanna share my ideas with all of you. Um, number two, being happy with our role in society. So happiness, our, our feelings, right? Um, number one, to be a tester and a discoverer. Um, so we test things, right? We analyze things in science. Number four, who gets to decide? Sometimes our peers or our superiors. Um, and so we, we have a collective, right? We have a scientific community that contributes um, and sometimes um, creates our benchmarks. Number one, to act upon curiosity. Number one, using observations to find out more about the world around us. Um, understanding the me mechanisms and causes of things using rigorous standardized approaches. Um, standardized, interesting word, we're gonna come back to that. 
being able to, to be comfortable and satisfied with where we are in our life and be proud of our accomplishments and what we have done. That's what it means to be successful. Number four, unfortunately, the dominant culture. So who is the dominant culture? Um, to do something new in, um, to be a scientist is to dedicate time towards asking questions. So that's often what we do, right? We ask questions. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of number three. So number three, not until it was, uh, till I was a grad student, did I feel like a real scientist. In undergrad, I felt like I was just doing what my advisors told me to do. But in grad school, I felt like I had more freedom to ask questions myself. So we're, we're learning to step out of the role of taking information, uh, but now thinking about ways in which we engage with it, right? What does it mean for me? What are the things that are interesting for me? Um, I like that. Took way too long for number three. <laughs> I think many of us experienced that as well. Um, not yet, um, you're still a grad student. So when do you think you might become an expert? I'm still waiting, right? So we all have different measures that we are um, engaging with. So thank you so much for all of you for, for chiming in. We'll keep this open. Um, and maybe, you know, we're gonna come back to it uh, near the end. Um, so we'll come back to that. So some of the questions that I want to start with, um, I'm gonna close my end of the chat or move it off to the side, but please continue to, to add to this. Um, so where do I come from? What lens do I view the world with? How does that influence my work? Um, and why is this an important question? I think it's an important question for all of us to ask ourselves, you know, where do I come from? How do I view the world? What influences my ideas, my thought process? Um, does it matter if I think in a different language? Does it matter if I have a different culture that I reference? Um, how does that relate to how I engage? I think there's a lot of questions that we ask ourselves um, implicitly, explicitly. Um, people ask us, and I think when we haven't asked ourselves these questions, it's very easy to get distracted. And so I think that these are really important and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I think these are really important. So a little bit about where I come from. Uh, I was born and raised in Sacramento, California. Um, I was born into a very large uh, Chicano family, indigenous family. Um, <clears throat> my parents raised us in very much the Chicano civil rights movements. Uh, so we were marching and protesting and boycotting with uh, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, the UFW um, farm workers. It was very much a, a central focus for my childhood. Um, Andrea Chavez, who's also here, we were raised probably in a very similar way. We've had so many conversations um, and it took until I, I was a postdoc that we actually met, even though our, our families are, are very closely connected. Um, so there's a picture in the top left, right, with me and my sister, I'm a twin, um, and my parents, it's, I love this picture because my parents sometimes often describe themselves as Chicano hippies or chippies, right, um, <laughs> and so we have this blend of, of cultures. Um, we grew up within blocks of all of my cousins on my dad's side of the family. Um, and we're all very close in age as well. So all of us were in high school, in middle school, in, in elementary school. I didn't understand the concept of a family reunion, what that actually means. Um, so people would talk about that in college, about how they're going home for this family reunion. And I was just so confused. What does that mean? Because we had that, you know, on a Tuesday with backyard barbecues. Um, and it was no big deal. That was just a natural, you know, process. I was a mariachi for many years. That's how I paid for um, actually my first year of college. Um, so I had, um, I was labeled as a professional, right? Um, at a very young, young age. Um, music is a very prominent part of my life. And I actually was, when I first got to UC Berkeley, I, I wanted to be a music major in addition to thinking about science. Um, and I love creating that connection between math and science and physics and waves um, to music. It has the ability to just transform our moods. And in and, and this past year, that has been very helpful <laughs> to, to, to focus on what kind of music I was listening to on a daily basis. Um, and I put this last picture on the bottom 
Um, my, I come from an educated family as well. My mother got her master's degree the same year that I got my PhD. And so when we were celebrating in Texas, UT Arlington, where I got my PhD, it was a, a big party for the both of us. And so that was a, a fun um, moment for both of us. Um, my mother's side, my father's side. Uh, I love the picture of my grandmother. She got her AA degree from San Diego City College. So my mother's family is more located in Southern California. Um, and, you know, people would ask my grandmother, you know, why, why did you go back to school at such um, an older age? Uh, and I loved her response. You know, you're never too old to learn. And when we were children and we would go spend time with our grandparents, that was something that almost every member of my family um, was focused on, that education is really powerful. So I never had the question of do I or do not do I not go to college that was you know ingrained in us that we were all going to go to college and actually all me and my brothers and sisters we all have degrees from um, UCs different UCs. So um, we're, we come from an educated side my father's side, uh, many of the members of my father side of the family were part of the military. Um, so there's a very strong American identity. Uh, what does it mean to be American? And that's an interesting question, especially with my grandfather. Uh, he was born in the States, US citizen, and then got deported uh, with the Re Repatriation Act. So he got deported to Mexico, I met my grandmother, uh, my, my Theo and my father were both born in Mexico and they came back um, to the States uh, through the military. So it's very interesting uh, conversations that we had this morning also about our migration stories when we are thinking about the Latinx community, we, we have very um, diverse migration stories. And, and, and I think that that's something that we don't acknowledge as often when we talk about Latinx people. My parents, you know, um, my father also has his master's degree. He would teach, my uncles would teach at Sac State when we were younger. Um, my father wore a big sombrero when he walked across the stage and they didn't have a rule really about that. Like what is the attire that you're supposed to be wearing? Um, and it made the papers. He also was wearing the Huelga Eagle uh, for the UFW movement um, when he crossed the stage. And he was also one of the biggest um, um, influences to bring Dia de los Muertos back to the state. So one of the oldest celebrations of Dia de los Muertos in, in the country started with my father in our community in Sacramento. Um, and now it's everywhere, right? <laughs> it's, it's so commercialized. Um, and whereas we started it and we still maintain it within my community as a very um, um, sacred ceremony and in honor. So that's just a little bit of where, you know, where I come from. I, I talk a lot about, you know, the lenses that we view and we use. And, and part of that is the identities that we choose. So my tío, my, my tío Ricardo Favela, um, he was faculty at Sac State, and there was quite a few people, including my father, um, who founded an, uh, an art collective, right? The Royal Chicano Air Force started as the Royal um, Chicano Art Front, and they would get confused a lot with the RCAF, uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, and so then they kind of ran with that, and then they're like, well, um, Chicanos, you know, we have our own Air Force as well. We fly Adobe planes, you know? And so they would have all this humor associated with politics. Um, and we would talk a lot about what does it mean to be Chicano? What does that term mean? And so this chart comes from a lot of conversations that my Theo Richard, my Theo Ricardo um, would talk to us about um, political ideologies and how does that influence our thinking? And so on one, one side, we have the extreme where we're Hispanic. And for me personally, I absolutely hate that term. I was talking about that this morning as well. It's a very um, dirty term for, for us. You know, we don't have that connection to Spanish culture aside from um, colonization and, and um, genocide. Yet my name is a very famous, you know, Spanish name. So there, there's this weird complexity with, with the term Hispanic for us. And so I tend not to use that, even though I will use it strategically depending on which audiences I'm part of. And then it gets kind of, you know, a lot more narrowed and focused. Um, and the other side, we have indígenas um, and I'm both, right? And, and there's a difference in terms of Chicano with an X and Chicana um, with a CH. Um, 
And so the way even that I pronounce my name, Chimena, is more of an indigenous um, twist to that. And so we were very much rooted in um, indigenous cultures, indigenous practices, even within the Chicano political ideology. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that because that shapes the ways in which we, we view. So I'm gonna shift a little bit and, and think about what are we exposed to? So I have four images on this screen and I wanna take maybe about 30 seconds to ask um, how many of them are you familiar with, right? Um, you can type in the chat if you want. Um, most of us can easily identify at least two, but which two? Um, and why is that important? Why am I bringing that up? Um, all but number four, all but number four, three, two and three, um, so many, many people have an understanding, right, of number two, number two is Stonehenge, number three are the pyramids in Egypt, but um, we don't acknowledge often the knowledge of the Americas, um, and that it's, very, it's been very strategic on why we don't do that, and that has an influence on how we might view ourselves, um, and so in some of my talks, I go into a lot of detail about all of these, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time on on just these two, number one and number four. Number one, Chichen Itza in, in Mexico. And number two, Chaco Canyon in um, Arizona area, on the Navajo reservation um, area. So Chichen Itza, why am I bringing these up? Um, I'm an astronomer uh, by training. I have my bachelor's degree in astrophysics from UC Berkeley. Um, first love is space. I love space. I think I get some of the, the most joy in life at seeing a clear dark sky. It, it brings me so much comfort to be able to go outside and look up at space and just be filled with wonder. I love it. Um, but yet we don't acknowledge that often when we think about scientific history, astronomy, astrology, not astrology, but astronomy, um, is often one of the, the gateway points for people when they think about STEM. So we think about going out and seeing the moon or seeing the, uh, a dark sky with stars. Um, some of us have had the great fortune of experiencing solar eclipses. Many of us have had the experience, uh, experience of witnessing uh, lunar eclipses, right? So when we see the eclipses, we're seeing three celestial bodies in action together. Um, and I think that that's a very powerful thing. Um, and we, so when we look at like, say, Stonehenge, there's an automatic kind of idea that comes with that, right? The equinoxes or the solstices, um, and people gather for that. But we also have that knowledge within the Americas and don't, don't acknowledge it when we talk about STEM culture. And so with the equinoxes that just passed, with this pyramid, um, it creates a serpent with the shadows. So there's a um, evidence, right, that we can use when we're talking about scientific history. Um, the same with the the El Caracol, with um, the pyramids. Often people attribute this with an observatory, and we might not necessarily um, they might not necessarily have used it with an observatory kind of perspective. But for sure, it's acknowledging some of our other um, planetary bodies, right? Venus um, is very prominent with the structures. The pyramids often we talk about in um, Egypt also have connections with astronomy and the ways in which they were built. The oldest book that we have found in the Americas is an astronomy book, right? Um, the Grolier Codex, Mayan astronomy. The Mayan civilization in terms of math, in terms of astronomy, in terms of time um, was so powerful and so knowledgeable. And yet it's almost completely erased from formal education when we are learning about science history. And for me, I grew up in a space where we were constantly acknowledging the knowledge that indigenous people have. We, we were, not only trained that way from a community perspective, but I also, I wasn't raised on a reservation, but in my formal education, there were programs specifically designed for indigenous students, elementary school, middle school. We were pulled out of our classrooms um, and taken into um, 
a different classroom for a week um, where we learned about different indigenous cultures within the states. There are 562, I believe, federally recognized sovereign nations, indigenous tribes that are sovereign, meaning they are not part of the US, but they're contained within the border of the US. Um, and there's many more tribes that are not federally acknowledged. And we also have people who are registered with their tribe that are not registered and also not registered with their tribe. So there's a very complex history of what it means to be indigenous. And so we had the opportunity where um, as children, we didn't know that that was a big deal to still be counted and not absent for school. As an adult who works with educator, educators, um, it's really important when we talk about funding. And so that was a, a, a special program that we were a part of that we learned about our culture and different cultures, different tribes, um, different languages, different cultural practices, different foods. Um, so I was formally taught about the knowledge within the Americas, um, but then in my normal classrooms, that was completely erased. Um, and so there was that kind of early conflict of where is my history being acknowledged? Um, what I really find interesting about Chaco Canyon is we have direct evidence that still exists that is um, aligned with our solstices, with our equinoxes. And again, this is not common knowledge, right? Um, hardly anyone knew about this site. And I did a little research over the past two nights um, and looked up the Ohio area. There are six different um, archeological sites that are within about an hour or two um, of the university that are, um, one is even a UNESCO World Heritage Site, right, because of the mounds. So within the Americas, there's a lot of rich astronomy history that we as educators can start to incorporate into our courses, especially for our um, non-science major courses, right, where it's almost exclusively talking about STEM education from a historical lens. Um, and yet very few of our curriculum actually include this knowledge, right? That we can go and visit and see, um, take a field trip and learn about the histories that our peoples have contributed to. And so it doesn't have to come straight from our European Western, Western view. Um, and I think that that's really gonna be a huge change as we start to incorporate more and more of our um, traditional knowledge into our coursework. Um, so STEM in the Americas, right, there's a lot, there's a lot, the oldest city um, that we know of in the Americas is down in like Peru area, and, and this morning we were talking about um, different skies that we see, right, the, the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere, and what, what are our constellation markers, the southern cross, um, very prominent in um, southern, Cal not southern California, the southern, uh, southern hemisphere, South America. But within you know, the Americas, we have astronomy, we have mathematics, and, and the Maya you know, independently developed the concept of zero. Um, and again, that's not, that's not really talked about. Um, the Maya also, their calendar is still one of the most accurate calendars um, in the world, not even just within our continents, but in the world. And what's really interesting is I was talking to a good friend of mine, uh, Sofia Cisneros, also native, um, Native Chicana particle physics, high energy physics theorist. Um, and I, I, I recently watched a talk from her and she was describing space time from a fractal perspective from the Mayan calendar. And I was just you know, blown away with how rich her talk was. Um, engineering, government, arts and culture, um, all of these things in the ways that we describe them are often um, not touched upon. And even now today, this city, um, Caral Supe, I think in, in Peru, um, engineers are still going to visit it to study the way that they built their city because of the um, structurally sound um, um, designs that they created in a very, um, you know, active tectonic region. And so these structures that are standing for 5,000 years, um, Engineering engineers are going and looking at them to see how well how they design them because they're still standing in such a uh, an active uh, region. So some of the lessons that I learned from from this is formal education in the U.S. is taught from a very Euro Western perspective, and when we do that, we forget that 
we have always been a part of these spaces, right? We've always been a part of these spaces. Our ancestors had extreme amounts of knowledge um, that we are still studying today because they were much more advanced than we are now in some of those areas. So that's a, an important lesson to acknowledge, right? That we are not told our history. We are not formally taught our history. Um, I asked the question of when do we become an expert, right? Um, I got my degree in astrophysics, the Chicano Latino grad. Uh, my father, artist, designed my graduation cap. I still have it in my office today um, from undergrad. It, I'm a very short person. Um, and so it was one of the ways that my family could also see me because it had this big um, paper mache um, chile with the heart um, on top. So my family could see me, it was great. Um, and so I had the same question, right? Am I a scientist right now? Can I, can I call myself a scientist? Can I call myself an astrophysicist with just a bachelor's degree? And so I had that question um, because I didn't also, I didn't feel like I was a scientist yet either at that point in my life. I want to acknowledge some of the different spaces that I, that I was a part of at Berkeley. Um, SACNAS for sure. I found SACNAS when I was an undergrad and it changed my whole um, way in which I engaged with my field. It was the first time that I really saw um, people like me bring their whole person, their whole self into the scientific space. So often what we experience is we fracture ourselves where our culture is left outside and then we're doing our science. And then when we go home, it's flipped, right? We leave our science outside and we come back into our culture. And so that was really one of the first times that I experienced um, the beauty of bringing our whole self into a space and, and not focusing on our identity, not being that the thing that is the first marker um, when we get there. Uh, I did research at the space science labs, um, the professional development program was one of the first scholars programs in the country that also gave me a sense of being. Um, and so I, I really want to accredit, uh, credit those, those spaces for allowing me to be successful in undergrad because I struggled quite a bit when I was in, in my undergrad years. So the lesson from that, right, you can't do this alone. You need to find your space, you need to find your people, you need to find your mentors. We very rarely do science individually, um, but finding a space where you feel comfortable to express your ideas um, to express your um, questions and thoughts in your way, right? We often have to also code switch a lot in the language that we use. Um, and that takes um, time to learn. How do we learn to speak scientifically? And why is it that we separate scientific talk from the way that we speak normally? I think those create barriers um, when we can't just freely express our ideas the ways that we would want to. So some of the, the mentors and the role models that I had, my cousin was my first role model. She was a civil engineer. She still is. She has her own company designing bridges in Southern California. Um, but I also really looked up to Ellen Ochoa. And I think that first SACNAS conference, I met her because she was a keynote speaker. And it, I was, you know, super fangirling <laughs> to see a Latina astronaut. And she became the first Latina to um, direct the, human, the, the Johnson Space Center in, in, in Houston. So very, very... Um, inspirational person. I saw her again, I think two years ago or three years ago at the SACNAS conference again. And it was um, you know, pretty awesome to be able to have my students go through the same experience that I did, that they were also um, awestruck and, and um, you know, fangirling to meet her in the same way that I was decades before them. So very, very powerful person. I worked with Jack, Janet Lumen, Dr. Janet Lumen. She was my first research advisor. And then I also want to acknowledge Hugo Ramirez, who was the director of PDP or one of the, the staff at, at PDP. And they created a space for us where often we would go and vent. <laughs> and so Uwo would come in sometimes or be leaving work while we were getting there to study for the night. Um, and sometimes when we would be venting, he would let us vent, but he would also you know, check us to you know, remind us that we are one of, at one of the most prestigious institutions in the world um, and to just, run with it, see what we can do by being in that space. How, how can we grow by being in that space? Graduate school, I started at Florida Tech, uh, was there from my first year, saw every shuttle launch in Florida for a year. Um, and, and so I'm fortunate that none of I mean, people aren't gonna be able to see that now because it's the best fireworks show I've ever seen in my life, especially the night launch, it was amazing. 
we would walk out to the beach, have a group meeting on the beach and watch the shuttle launch and then go back to work. <laughs> it was great. Um, he moved us to UT Arlington and I, um, I'm still a collaborator with him to this day. Um, so he's a great, great um, friend, great collaborator, great, great mentor. Um, lessons I learned from that, I didn't expect to move as much as I did. So be open to change. We never know who's gonna come into our lives. We never know who's gonna influence our lives. Um, your networking ability, especially through organizations like SACNAS, um, is very, very powerful. And so I think um, being open to who you meet, um, being open to opportunity, recognizing opportunity is not always easy, but being open to opportunity and what that could bring you. Um, we also don't stay in the same research fields, right? Um, we kind of shift depending on the information that we're given. So it broadens our perspectives, it broadens our ideas so that we can start to form our own ideas. You know, this idea of expert-like thinking, someone posted in the chat when I had the ability to start asking my own questions. Um, that changes depending on how we engage and who we engage with. And so just be open to new ideas is um, very powerful. Sometimes people get very, very focused, especially when you're a grad student, your focus should be getting your dissertation done. Um, and so you should have that narrow focus at some time, but other times you can be very open um, to seeing what your possibilities are. For me, what that meant is I started in astrophysics. I come from an artistic family. The way that I view the world is very much a visual um, representation, my mental representations. Um, I was doing space plasmas. I loved it. I loved to be able to um, see an explosion on the sun, right? Either with a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection, which is the atmosphere um, of the sun. And you can kind of see that here in these um, white spaces. Um, so instead of being astrophysics, where it's everything outside of our solar system, I was exposed to space sciences, space physics, which is confined within our solar system. And so I could see something happen on the sun and a few days later, um, see the effects on earth, right? With whether that was Northern lights or, um, you know, the, the electric grid getting overwhelmed. In the 80s, I believe, or early 90s, there was a huge event that happened that took out a satellite and half the um, pagers went down, right? The satellite uh, was supporting all these pagers and that went down at the time. So there, there's direct implications for what's happening in space to what we experience here on Earth. Um, and so I became very fascinated with that. And when I got to grad school, I was looking at the ways we represent our ideas. And so the top image is an image that's taken from a textbook. Um, and so we were learning about magnetic perturbation. When you have a current system, the magnetic field starts to alter because of that current system. And that's something we learn in introductory physics. Um, but we were asking grad students to solve a problem about this current system in the magnetic field um, in the Northern hemisphere, in the Southern hemisphere, on the day side, on the night side. And it became too much um, for cognitive processing, right? Your cognitive load was increased. Um, and when we presented it in a different representation, a 3D representation, all of that cognitive load was reduced and it became a very simple uh, problem for these grad students. And so that blew my mind, how we represent information, how we teach and learn physics drastically changes who is successful, who can graduate, who can finish a course, um, and what our ideas are, the formation of our own ideas. Um, so that became very, very fascinating for me, is the ways in which we represent things, and probably because I come from an artistic family, and we're doing different kinds of representations in a lot of the artwork um, that my family was producing. So I think that if we're not acknowledging where we come from and the exposure that we've had, we're doing ourselves a disservice um, because it does influence the questions that we ask. Um, and so that shifted my field of focus from um, space plasmas more into the teaching and learning or physics education. I'm gonna try to pick up my pace a little bit because I realized that I'm moving slow. Um, I graduated with my PhD 2011 and I said, you know, this time maybe I'm an, a legit physicist. Am I a legit physicist at that time? Yes. I think anytime that we are doing science, we can call ourselves a scientist. Um, and so that's a, a process that we go through when we're 
becoming scientists is when can I do that? Um, and I still question it depending on which space I'm a part of, like, um, but I no longer have that self-doubt. Physics can be exclusionary. Physics is a culture of no culture. Um, this is this idea that we are fact-based, that there is no social construct associated with it. Um, and so when I would hear this in my community, I would always ask, well, where do I fit within that? You know, we're talking about all this data, the best practices, curriculum that we've developed, um, measures of success. And none of those conversations ever were about people like me. And so I would always ask myself, like, do I really belong here? Um, am I a physicist? Is this work including people like me? Um, and that became a, a tension point for me. I became very angry. Um, I had a lot of self-doubt, um, you know, and, and I had to work through that. And I worked through that with colleagues that are in, in the space today as well. I think there's a lot of cultural conflicts when we talk about science and I'm speaking about science from my experience, which is physics. Um, often we are, we are taught to forget who we are um, and adopt this normative culture. Um, so acknowledge the, the systems that we are a part of. So that changes who we are and it becomes, for me, it became a very big um, conflict, internal conflict of how do I engage? Um, can I bring myself into these spaces? So what does a physicist look like? We get so much outside influence that shapes our ideas. And often we might not even be aware of it. You can do a Google search. Very few people of color come up when you type in physicist. Very few women come up. Um, and so that's one source of an, of an influence, right? Our visual representations. Um, we also have pop culture, right? The Big Bang Theory, where these, representations of our field might not align with who we are. For some, I think they might, but for others, that's creating a, a source of tension as well. Like, I don't fit with that. I'm already othered. And so if I'm, if I'm thinking about my field, it becomes, for me, it was, la it was a laughing point. Like, that's not who I am. Um, but there are people that I knew that were like that. And so that was a representation for them, but not for me. We get influences from all kinds of places, right? Um, especially with social media and, and news outlets, um, there's constant points of information that are coming that are negative, right? Um, and social media is great in the sense that it allows us in real time to counteract some of these ideas, but also we get flooded with it because of the algorithms um, that are being used. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what was happening within the physics community. There was the, the you know, college scandals that, that have happened that also um, look at who is admitted and who is not, um, and what is the narrative surrounding those. So Fisher versus UT, which is the top image, she was a subpar student um, who started blaming her rejection um, on people of color. And that went up to the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court, not the state Supreme Court, but the US Supreme Court twice. Um, she felt this entitlement that she um, should have gotten accepted to this institution. And the same with this newest scandal, there's an entitlement associated with who should be able to go to college and who can afford it, right? Um, and then that, that, that feeds into this idea of, um, where do people of color, where is our narrative being described, right? That um, we are getting a helping hand or we are lowering our standards if we are emitting um, or holding slots for, right? So that narrative starts to influence the way that we see ourselves. Am I lucky to be here or did I earn it? Um, and that's not just from our, our faculty or our administrators, but it's also our peers that look at us sometimes in a different way that then that starts to seep in to our internal dialogue. Um, and so I, I wanna you know, kind of create this, this juxtaposition of our um, sense of belonging, imposter syndrome, right? Has that sense of self-doubt. We, and we start to create this narrative is we belong here. We deserve a seat at the table. Um, these are new spaces for black indigenous people of color. Um, we are forming, this new initiative for diversity and inclusion, um, you know, or these programs that are designed for people of color. And a lot of the time, 
that narrative is designed to help us, right? Support us. And when we have that as our narrative, as the foundation for our narrative, it's putting us in a place um, lower than, right? Or this deficit model. And so I want to kind of encourage us to change that narrative. Also, when we talk about art, uh, my, art my family are artists, right? So that's always going to be a part of who I am. Um, folk art versus fine art. Um, who gets to decide on what's considered fine art um, in museums or folk art or crafts? Um, but our sense of belonging, if we start to change that narrative, like we have always been a part of STEM spaces, STEAM spaces, so to speak, if we add art into that equation. Um, and it, we would have a better way of acknowledging that if we are taught our history. Um, colonialism and genocide were very strategic in removing our histories, our languages, our children. Um, they, they inflicted vast amounts of trauma. Um, and we see that in, even in our DNA, right? Um, and so I think that that was done very strategically as a measure of control. And so we need to start to let go of that narrative and bring back our own narrative that we have always been a part of these spaces. These are not new for us. I think it's very important to acknowledge when we are firsts, right? Because that's an accomplishment that we have the ability to um, say, but it's also an acknowledgement to the institutions and the spaces that we occupy. Um, because we're only the first for the systems that were designed to keep us out to begin with. Our systems are di were designed very strategically to prevent us from being a part of it. And so that's a different way of processing why am I a first? It's not because we didn't have that knowledge to begin with or that opportunity, it's because it was designed intentionally. Um, fine art, right? We should, we should be able to call ourselves fine artists as well. Language of science. Um, I started having a lot of these conversations as a grad student, as a postdoc, even as an early faculty member. And often when I would talk about, you know, this study that was done or this curriculum that was developed, um, and I would raise the, the question of who did you study? Um, was, it, was it a representation of all people that are studying physics? So you're making a, a standard of where our measures of success should be um, defined, but you haven't talked about who you made that standard for. Um, and I would say that and I would ask that question and often the, the answer would be, well, show me the data. And I, and I respect that as a scientist, right? We are data driven, we, are, we analyze things. And so I started to do work with colleagues and um, we started really looking at who do we study? Um, so we did this paper with, like I mentioned, some colleagues from Ohio and I wanted to you know, give them a shout out. Um, well, we were looking at gender and gendered minorities. Um, and often when we talk about indigenous cultures, right, the LGBT community, what does that mean? It wasn't until colonialism came that also described that there's only two, binary, man and woman, biological, or whatever people want to discuss. Um, whereas if we look at different indigenous populations, um, they were honored and they were um, celebrated um, and often looked at as, um, leaders and, and medicine people and, um, you know, just viewed in a very different way. Um, and so we did this paper where we were thinking about gender um, within our field and how do we describe that and what do our studies look like? Um, we know that it's, our, our field is primarily white, male, cisgendered, non-disabled. Um, um, and that influences, again, who our populations are and where our entry points are and what our um, baselines are based off of. Um, and I really like this, this image of um, this comic, right, where you have all these different animals and their assessment is go climb that tree. Um, and so if you can climb that tree, you can be successful. But what's the fish going to do? Um, you know, is that, does that mean that they can't um, be successful? And, and I like the quote as well as everybody is a genius, but if you find, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. And so I think that often it applies to um, folks that are not represented um, because this narrative is not about us. It's about a very specific population. And so when we make our references to that specific population, we are already not included. 
And so we then start to see ourselves in a very different way. Um, well prepared mathematically. So it's another study that I did with Steve Canham where we really did break down our field. We went back from 1970 to 2015. We looked at every PER paper, um, physics education paper that was published uh, in three main journals. It took us quite a long time to do this, um, but we, we looked at it very, very much from an analytical data perspective. And again, it, it supports this idea that it's well-prepared mathematically, um, primarily white populations, affluent, so wealthy populations, um, elite institutions, calculus-based courses, um, and affluent, like affluent populations already, I said that as well. So this does not include everybody. In fact, it's a very small portion of people who actually take physics. Most people who take physics, um, are not within the calculus-based sequence. They're not even gonna be physicists to begin with um, because our field from that introductory perspective is a service course for every single field. So if all we're doing is supporting those that are gonna continue on, what are we doing for the biologist or the chemist or the person that doesn't wanna go into academia, the engineer? How is it that we're supporting them? How is it that we look at community college? We know absolutely nothing about two-year colleges. Right? And we know for a fact that two-year colleges have the most representation um, that reflect the population, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a skewed perspective, very much skewed perspective. There's so many more details in that paper. If you're interested, you can go um, and look it up. There's a lot of work that was done by Scott Page that looks at the benefits of diversity. Um, so when you have a group that's working on a problem, um, diverse groups, diverse perspectives um, create more efficient solutions, better solutions um, to begin with. So it's, it's not about, is it good? We already know it's good. The data's there. It's the ways in which we have to start to change our narrative. Um, and again, this is also with respect to the, the key phrases, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice. Right now they're key phrases, but what does it actually mean? Um, we're not always talking about everybody. So why not talk about who it is we are actually referencing. If our target is Black, Latino, Latinx populations, speak about that. Stop creating an overgeneralized narrative um, because it's already erasing people and it creates a conflict um, on what it is we're trying to do. What's our goal? Are you helping us? Are you saving us? Um, most of the time we don't need saving. Right? We just need the same types of opportunities. Um, and that means acknowledging that we're all starting at different places. So we've known for years that standardized assessments are biased. This is not new, right? The SATs, the GREs, we know, and we've been knowing that these are not good measures of success. And yet we continue to use them because it's easy. So it's, it's our laziness that is still contributing um, to the way our fields continue to look. With COVID, um, we're starting to change that, right? We were forced to change that. Um, change is not easy. So it takes a lot of effort and a lot of resources to make change. And so then that becomes a question of, of what is it that we actually value? So what do our institutions value? Um, it's not an endless amount of resources that we have access to, especially now with COVID, right? Many of our institutions are facing budget issues. And so we have to then start to ask, well, what is it that we value? If our values are about making our spaces more inclusive, what are we gonna do to actually address that problem? Um, so that's something that we have to have hard conversations about. Um, and it takes, like I said, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of resources to make change, um, but we're starting to do that. We, we start to see that now, especially with COVID. There's a couple of other papers that I wanna highlight. Uh, PNAS, this, this paper that came out within the last year or two, um, the diversity innovation paradox in science, they did something similar to what we did, me and, and my colleague, Steve Canham. They looked at dissertations, right? Um, all of the dissertations that were published, I forget which years, um, but they looked at the, the, the dissertations that were published by um, minoritized populations, underserved populations, underrepresented populations. Um, and they're finding the same thing, that innovative um, ideas 
um, are being suppressed, are being um, not acknowledged. So lessons that we learn from all of these things is to let go of the dominant narrative. It didn't include us to begin with. It's still not including us now. So we need to have our own narrative that allows us to just shine as we are. Be, be you, do you, you are enough. Your ideas are enough. Um, we need to start to remind ourselves and what are the influences that we have. I keep a happy folder. Um, and this year it's been a little challenging with COVID, very challenging with COVID. Um, and my really, really hard days, I've looked at my happy folder, which are letters of reference from colleagues, letters of reference from students, um, the papers that I've published, the awards that I've won, um, because sometimes I forget that I'm doing okay, right? Just by being in my space. Um, and we all are doing okay just by being in your space, by just be, being yourself. Um, your life experiences are extremely valuable. They shape the work that you do. They shape the questions they, that you ask. Um, and I think that we need to start to remind ourselves that a little bit more, um, that we, it's okay to bring our whole self into our field. It's okay to um, use the language that feels comfortable to us, right? It doesn't have to be so rigid. Um, and that's a hard one because we, we also have to remember what goal do we have and what audience are we speaking with? We have to learn to navigate that. Um, and so we still do have to play the game, right? You still do have to play the game of academia um, by meeting the benchmarks that are designated for us, but we can do that in a different way. Um, so back to these questions, trying to keep track of time, uh, back to these questions of what does it mean to be a scientist? What does it mean to be successful? How long does it take to develop expert-like thinking? And who gets to decide? Um, all of those questions are, are things that I continue to come back to. There is no one answer, right? Um, we all have our own journey that we're walking. Um, but I think the who gets to decide, that question for me is very powerful. I no longer have to look at my um, peers and what they've all done. Um, part of that is I have security. I just got tenure um, last year. So I think there's different measures, there's different points as well as when can we challenge the system? What power do I have to challenge the system? Um, you, as the, those of you that are students in the audience, maybe you're administrators, you don't want to hear this, but as students, you're very powerful. You're tuition paying bodies, right? Um, so you have a lot of power when you organize yourselves. Um, you have a lot of power to create the demands on the administration because the administration's overall purpose is to serve you. And so when you start to acknowledge that, you can start to organize yourselves to really think about what is it that we as students find valuable? And that's very powerful to be able to take a step back to identify what that decision-making process is like. Um, and again, as students, like I said, you're very powerful as tuition paying parties. Black indigenous people of color have always been a part of STEM or STEAM. Um, Black indigenous people of color will always be a part of STEAM. We are always gonna be here. And so I think that's the, the thing that I wanna leave my talk with today. So thank you everyone for joining me. Um, I really appreciate all the time that you're dedicating to be here today. Thank you to Ohio State and the Sakna Shopper at Ohio State as well. Um, that's it. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Sid. That was really inspiring and amazing.